To understand the idea of the celestial sphere, first think of the Earth in space. The stars all around us look as if they could be on the inside of a huge distant sphere. Though the stars are really at different distances, this idea of the celestial sphere is very useful for giving positions in the sky. Now imagine you are close to the North Pole. Here, it is like being on a roundabout because the Earth is spinning on its axis once a day. Every day, each star circles all around you and around the point overhead, which is the celestial North Pole. There is, of course, a celestial South Pole as well, and the celestial equator circles the sky halfway between the poles. Positions on the celestial sphere are specified by two coordinates. Declination, like latitude on Earth, is measured in degrees north or south of the equator. Positive declinations are north, negative declinations south. Right ascension, the equivalent of longitude, is measured in hours from a zero line. An hour is 15 degrees. Because you are on the Earth's surface, half of the sky is completely hidden. The Earth gets in the way and creates your horizon. In effect, your personal sky is like a hemispherical dome. Imagine now you move to the Earth's equator. The celestial equator runs from east to west through the zenith, the overhead point. The celestial poles are due north and south on the horizon. The north-south line on the sky through the zenith is called the meridian. At an intermediate latitude, the altitude of the celestial pole in the sky is equal to your latitude on Earth. Some stars are circumpolar and never set. It's sometimes useful to know a star's altitude, its height above the horizon, and its azimuth, its compass direction. Azimuth is measured round the horizon from north, but as the stars move, their altitude and azimuth constantly change. Hi, I'm David Fuller from the Eyes on the Sky video series. In this last Stargazing Basics video, we'll learn how to easily measure distance in the sky so you can find constellations or objects more easily, either naked eye, with binoculars, or telescopes. In our first video, we learned that a line called the meridian splits the sky into equal halves from north to south. If we were to place a giant protractor in place of that line, it would appear as if the sky was 180 degrees from horizon to horizon. Although space is actually infinite, our minds have difficulty comprehending that, so our eyes make the night sky appear like a half sphere. So for all practical purposes, it's easier to think of the sphere when we look out at the sky. And though distance on a sphere should technically be measured in radians, Degrees is a concept people understand more readily, and it works for our purposes. So horizon to horizon, say from the east all the way to the west, is 180 degrees. That's easy enough. And if we measured another large distance from horizon to the zenith overhead, that would produce a right angle, or 90 degrees. Still pretty simple, right? But to measure smaller angles than that, we need a measuring tool. A ruler doesn't work because that would be for linear measurement, and holding a protractor to our eyes, that's a bit impractical. So what to do? Easy. Use your hands. Check this out. Hold your hand at arm's length. Now spread your thumb 
and pinky as far away from each other as possible. If you look across your thumb and pinky, that distance is approximately 25 degrees. Now don't worry, this works for almost everyone. Don't believe me? Look for the Big Dipper in the night sky. See the last two stars in the bowl of the dipper? Draw a line through them from the bottom of the bowl towards the top. Now hold your hand at that top star along that line. The other side of your outstretched hand should now be near the second magnitude star, Polaris, the North Star, because that distance is just about 25 degrees. But sometimes we need to measure even smaller distances than 25 degrees. This time, hold up your forefinger and pinky and stretch them out. The distance across them is about 15 degrees. This is about the distance from Polaris, that star we just found, to Kochab, another second magnitude star in the bowl of the Little Dipper. For another smaller tool, just hold up your fist. Across the top of your fist from side to side is about 10 degrees of sky. Find Cassiopeia, which is sort of opposite in the sky from the Big Dipper across Polaris. If you measure from the bottom point of the W shape to the opposite tip, that is about 10 degrees approximately. To split that in half now, hold up these three fingers. This approximates five degrees in the sky. Those two stars at the end of the Big Dipper are about five degrees from each other, or the tip to point stars in Cassiopeia are about that as well. Hold up your hand and see if your fingers match that. It should. And lastly, the one degree tool. Simply hold up your pinky. This one amazes people because the actual angular distance across the full moon, though it sometimes appears huge in the sky, is only half of a degree. So holding your pinky at arm's length, you can cover the whole moon. Of course, mixing and matching these can help you find even more. Two hands like this can measure halfway across the 90 degrees of horizon to zenith, approximating 45 or 50 degrees or so. Use other combinations to create 30, 35, or 40 degrees just by using two hands. But how will you know how far an angle is in the sky by using a star chart? The declination lines will tell you degrees, but only in that direction. Try downloading the sky maps, all sky star charts each month. These charts are about 180 millimeters across. Now that's not terribly useful to use a ruler at the edges as the sky diagrams are stretched there, but you can use a ruler with millimeters on it to measure approximate angular distances in the sky for most other areas on that chart, helping you to hop from bright stars or well-known constellations to the dimmer ones. Just estimate the millimeters and then you can estimate the angle. Give it a try, it's really easy and works for just about everyone. Thanks for watching, I'm David Fuller. Keep your eyes on the sky and your outdoor lights aimed down by using dark sky friendly lighting fixtures so we can all see what's up. Hey, it's Professor. as the Earth rotates. This star, the North Star, was useful for navigation for thousands of years and remains useful to this day, leading any navigator in a northward direction, no matter where you're standing in the Northern Hemisphere. But for reasons that we now know have to do with Earth's motion around the Sun, the celestial sphere changes very slowly throughout the year. Different stars are visible at different times of the year, as well as different constellations, and this was an important method of marking the passage of time. Rather than any meaningful message from the gods, this phenomenon occurs simply because we can't see stars behind the sun, because it's way too bright, and at different times in Earth's orbit around the sun, the sun is blocking different stars. We can only see stars during nighttime, when the half of the Earth we are on is pointed away from the Sun. So some constellations go missing and others appear until we get back to where we started, all in a predictable annual cycle. 
The line that the sun traces in its movement across the sky is called the ecliptic. Named as such because if the moon crosses this line, we have the potential to see an eclipse. We now understand that this line, followed by the planets as well, is simply the plane of the solar system. But the sun's path changes depending on the time of year in a way that correlates with the seasons. So what are seasons and why do we have them? Many people think that this has to do with the Earth's distance from the sun. Farther away, colder, winter. Closer, hotter, summer. But summer in the northern hemisphere happens at the same time as winter in the south, and vice versa, so that can't be right at all. Instead, the seasons occur because of the tilt in Earth's rotational axis. This is the imaginary line that the Earth spins around. As it turns out, this axis is not perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. It's actually 23.5 degrees from the vertical. This means that one hemisphere is getting more direct sunlight than the other at certain times of the year. In the summer, the axis of rotation is tilted towards the sun, and the northern hemisphere gets the most direct sunlight, while the southern hemisphere gets sunlight at an oblique angle. So the northern hemisphere gets more heat and more daytime. In the winter, the axis of rotation is tilted away from the sun, and the southern hemisphere gets lots more sunlight. More heat and more daytime, while nights get longer and colder up north. This tilt also explains the varying angle of the ecliptic. Because of the way the Earth is tilted during different times in orbit, the sun will rise and set at different places in the horizon. The spring equinox, or vernal equinox, as well as the fall, or autumnal equinox, are the two days where the sun crosses the celestial equator. The summer solstice and winter solstice are the days where the sun is the furthest away from the celestial equator, rising and setting furthest north or south. These days mark the passage of the four seasons, and we were able to observe this in the sky long before we knew why it happened. Ancient monuments like Stonehenge in England are very clearly structures based around these phenomena, as in this case, the openings between stone pillars are meant to frame the sunrise and sunset for an observer standing at the center, specifically on these special days. Other monuments like pyramids and temples exhibit some kind of alignment with the sun on certain special days as well. But contrary to whimsical conjecture, it is not necessary to evoke aliens or magic to explain this. It is just the result of careful observations of the celestial sphere over many generations. Lastly, the ancients were fascinated by the moon, as it is the only object that significantly changes its appearance over time. The moon has cycles in which it waxes and wanes, from full to new to full again, with crescent shapes in between. These are called the lunar phases. Their explanation is quite straightforward, and contrary to popular belief, it has nothing to do with shadows. Only the face of the moon that is pointed towards the sun is illuminated, and therefore visible. If that side is pointed towards Earth, when the moon is opposite the sun, the moon is full. If pointed away, when the moon is on the same side as the sun, it's new. Anywhere in between, and we get a crescent of some kind. If the moon passes directly between the sun and the Earth, that is called a solar eclipse, and the moon will completely block out the sun, leaving the Earth in its shadow. When the Earth is directly between the sun and the moon, leaving the moon in Earth's shadow, that is called a lunar eclipse. These were mysterious sights in the ancient skies, often interpreted as ominous signals from the gods. But just as with everything else, we began to learn how to predict these events as well. Let's continue and see what happened next in our quest to understand the cosmos.